makes it a little easier. But uh, after hearing that song this morning, they, uh, I think that most of you probably can figure out which scripture we're probably going to today. Uh, started off our study in healing, uh, our sermon series in healing, uh, talking about uh, or singing that song. But this morning I want to get around to the story that goes with that song. And um, as we get into our story this morning, we will be in, um, in, in John chapter 5. But before we get there, you can go ahead and be turning, but the, we see that Jesus has been healing uh, all the stories, all the, the scriptures that we've used so far. We've been in Mark. And, and everywhere that Jesus has been, he has been in Galilee. And as he went into Galilee and as he traveled around Galilee, everybody knew who he was. And they followed him and they, they, they stayed with him and they brought all their sick to him. And everybody in Galilee, word had gotten around who Jesus was. But today we're going to see that Jesus was in Jerusalem. Now we only see Jesus a few times in the scripture in Jerusalem. Some would say three, some would say four. Uh, and it depends on, uh, there, there's actually some question because when you've got four different gospels given, four different accounts of his traveling, uh, nobody knows for sure how many times. Now most people believe that we have record of four different times that he was in, was in Jerusalem. And each one of these was around the Passover. Jesus was a good Jew. He, he really was. He followed the Jewish tradition, or he followed the Jewish law, and, and he came to Jerusalem at the times of feast. And for that reason, we believe that, I've always heard my whole life that, that Jesus' ministry was three years. Well, it's more likely three and a half to four years that he was actually in ministry. And uh, so we see him each year at Passover. He came into Jerusalem uh, during the feast. Now, I believe that this is probably his second time in Jerusalem during his ministry. The reason that I believe that is in chapter 4, we see him returning to Galilee when he stopped and, and spoke with the woman at the well. It says that he was returning from Judea into Galilee. So we know, but, but John doesn't actually record him being in Jerusalem before. Uh, but here we see him, you know, in Jerusalem coming in for the Passover. Now, one thing that I want you to notice is, is when Jesus came into Jerusalem, nobody hardly knew who he was. In Galilee, we saw him thronged with people. We saw that people were around him. People were with him everywhere that he, he went. But here today, this story, we're going to see that he came into Jerusalem and nobody reacted. Nobody at this point really knew who he was. He hadn't, he hadn't done a whole lot in Jerusalem up to this point. Now, that doesn't mean that people didn't need to be healed. There was all kinds of people that needed to be healed. There was, there's always those in need. There will always be those in need. As long as time goes on, there will be people in need. There will be hungry people. There will be people who need healing. There will be people that need Christ. And, and here we see him coming to into Jerusalem at the Sheep Gate. Now I want to give you a little bit of background on this, but we're going to read the scripture first in chapter 5, verse 1. It said, After this... There was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an, an, an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? 
The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this story. We thank you for this account in Scripture of a miracle that you did. And Lord, we just pray that you would just show us today that you are still doing miracles. You're still working in our lives. You're still asking, do you want to be well? Do you want to be whole? And Lord, as we study your word today, we just pray that you'll reveal to us all that you want us to know. In your name we pray. Amen. Now. Like I said, Jesus is walking around and, and nobody really knows who he is. He's not that well known in Jerusalem, but yet people, they, they, they come in throngs needing to be healed. There is always a multitude of people who need something. And these people, they didn't know about Jesus, but they knew that God was a powerful God. They knew that, that, that the story was, anyway, that at this pool of Bethesda, if they laid there, or if they were, if the water was stirred in a certain season by an angel that the first one into the pool would get uh, would get healed would be healed of whatever infirmity they had now uh, it said that many people laid by this pool have you, any of you ever tried to call a radio station and be caller 5 or caller 6 or whatever they say and try to win a contest well, as you may, it's hard to do. Well, these people, they, they laid around this pool and, and they waited for the water to stir and only one person would get healed. Now, we don't know for sure this is the only account in the scripture of this happening. Now, a lot of commentaries, some of the commentaries that I've read uh, didn't actually believe that this was an angel who did this. They believed that, that this may have been a pool that got just, you know, had underground tremors or whatever and caused the water to stir. And people believed that they could be healed. And for that reason, they laid there. Now, I, the, the scripture says that the angel came and stirred the waters and people got in. So I believe that this was a, a means of God's grace. And he would send his angel on occasion. And, and we know that angels are, are very powerful. And, and the angel would stir the water. And whoever had faith enough, and it came down to the faith, whoever had faith enough to step into that water and be the first one in the water would be healed of whatever was bothering them. Now, the thing is, is at Bethesda's pool, there's actually, and it was quite an amazing place, uh, this was at the Sheep Gate. This was the area of Jerusalem where they would bring in the sheep. Now, this was very near the temple, kind of at the corner of where the temple was. And when you go out onto one of these porches, uh, you're, I, I bet, 20, 30 feet above where the pool was. It was pretty, pretty amazing to step out there and see this where this was. And there's actually two, a divided pool here. And, and it's believed that what would happen is, is as it, during certain times, people would come into Jerusalem and have to offer sacrifice. And you would bring your animal, or you would bring your sheep in through the sheep gate, because that's where Bethesda's pool was. You would bring them in through the sheep gate. Now, you didn't want to take a dirty sheep up to be sacrificed. So you've been traveling all this way with your sheep. You would take one, there was two pools, you would take your sheep and you would wash your sheep in this pool. But then there was another pool over here that was for the people to wash in. Ceremonially wash, get ready to, to go up to the temple to offer your sacrifice. Now, I don't know which pool it was that was getting stirred. I, I hope it was the one that the people got in. Uh, but, you know, God can use dirty water as well. I mean, you go all back, way back to Gehazi and, and, that, you know, and said, well, well ain't, ain't our rivers cleaner than the Jordan? <laughs> so God can use the dirty water to, to, to heal with too. But they, they came here and, and laying by the pool of Bethesda served two different purposes. Because where did most people that were lame or injured or, or had something wrong, they would go as people came into the temple and that's where they would beg for alms. 
So if you sat by the Bethesda's pool, you were in the way of the people who were coming into Jerusalem, those people coming into the temple. You were in their way. So you had two purposes. You were there so that if you could get be the first one in the pool, you got healed. But if you didn't, you were in the perfect place to beg for alms of those people who were coming into the temple. So, so being there at Bethesda's pool had dual purposes. So here we see this man who is laying by the pool waiting. Now, I don't know about you, but if I am a sick person... And, and I'm waiting by the pool to be healed, where am I going to be laying? I'm going to be laying right, right here on the edge of the pool. I'm going to be just as close to that pool as I can be. So that when the water's stirred, all I've got to do is roll a little bit. If I, if I can't get around too good, that's where I'm going to be. But if I'm there and I'm laying on this edge of the pool, then I lose my opportunity to beg from the people who are coming up to the temple. So in order to beg from the people coming to the temple, I've got to be over here in their path as they're coming through. Now when the water's stirred, I've got to move to get over here. And that's why we, you know, when I first read this story years ago, uh, my question was, well, why wasn't they laying on the edge of the pool? Well, then they, you get to thinking about it, they're on their way to the temple. They're, they're in the way to beg. Now, Jesus comes up and there is a multitude, a huge multitude of people who are laying there, who are sitting there waiting for people to give them money or waiting to be healed. It begs the question, why is this man the one that Jesus chose? Now we know that this man has had an, an infirmity, whatever it may be, whatever was wrong with him, but he has had a sickness for 38 years. Now we know that it's something that hindered him from being able to get up very fast and move to the pool. So here he is who's been sick for 38 years. Now maybe that is why Jesus healed him. Maybe because he knew that he was the one who had been the sickest the longest. Maybe it was because he knew his heart and knew that this man wanted to know more about him. Maybe he knew, we don't, we don't know what it was, but for some reason God or Jesus chose this particular man. Now of all the other people that were laying there by the, by the pool, Jesus walked up to this man and said, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made better? Do you want to be like everybody else? Folks, this is the same question that Jesus asked every individual. You see, when I read this story and I read what Jesus did for this man and I read what, what he asked this man, I see salvation in this story. I see salvation in this story and I, and I do love how the King James Version says will you be, be made whole rather than do you want to be made well because as, as you look at this this is what Jesus asked me. He asked me years and years ago 42 years ago he said do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be whole? Here's the thing, D Jesus didn't just come and say, hey, you're saved. He asked me, do you want to be? You see, Jesus provides it to all of us. Jesus could have healed everybody laying by the pool. And had they known who he was, they probably would have thronged him and asked him to heal them. And, and my guess is that as we get into the next part of this scripture, when Jesus healed this man, he had to get away pretty quick or everybody would have because they saw what he was able to do. But here's the thing. Jesus doesn't just come up to people and just heal them. He waited and he asked them, do you want to be made well? Do you? He waited until they came to him. Folks, I see, like I said, I see the, the, the story of my salvation here. You see, 42 years ago, Jesus invited me. He came to me and said, I want to be a part of your life. I want to, I want to save you. 
I want to give you salvation. I want to live in your heart. Do you want that? He didn't just come and do it. He provided it freely to me, but he didn't just come and do it. Well, that's what he's asked each one of us, but that's, all, that's the way he asked this guy. See, God is not a God that forces His way into anybody's life. He doesn't force His way onto you. He gives you that opportunity. What would have happened if this man had said, No, I would rather just lay here and beg. I would rather just lay here and feel sorry for myself. What do you think Jesus would have done? I believe that Jesus would have walked away from him. I believe that Jesus would have gave, went to somebody else laying by the pool and said, well, what about you? And I, the reason I believe that is because I know the story of the, of the banquet feast. I know the story of the banquet feast where God had prepared, where the king had prepared this big banquet and he invited the people to come and the people didn't show up. So what did he do? He went out and invited more. He went out and invited more and more and more. But those who he had invited to begin with that didn't come, they lost their opportunity to come. You see, that's why I know that, that had this man said, no, I don't, I don't really want to be healed. I, I've, got it, I've got it pretty good right here. I'm in a good spot and there's a lot of people giving me money, so I'm just going to stay right here. I don't want to be made whole. If I get made whole, I'm going to have to go out and get a job. I'm going to have to work. So I'll just stay here. Now, had, had this man said that, Jesus would have walked away from him and went and healed somebody else, I believe. But he didn't. But here's what he did. He did make an excuse. Have you ever noticed that, that, that when, when Jesus comes to us, we, we have all these reasons. We have all this stuff. We, we, we unload a lot of stuff. This guy said, well, well I would, but. I, I would, but. Here's, here's my problem. I can't get into the pool. You know, when, when the water's stirred, uh, I can't move fast enough and somebody gets there before me. And I don't have anybody to help me. Once again, I see my story of salvation. I can't get there. I can try, and I can try, and I can work at it, and I can, I can give it my best effort, but I can't get there. I can't get there on my own. But guess what? We invite people to church, and, and we bring people. So I, I, now I've got somebody, but guess what? They can't get me there either. You know, the person that you invite to church, the person that invited you to church, whatever, whoever it may be, the person, who, the person who helps you, the person who's there for you, they can't do it for you either. Had this man had somebody there that was ready to pick him up and run to the pool with him, they couldn't have got him there any fast. They couldn't have got him there fast enough. And that's what this man said. I, I can't get there on my own. I can't make it. And I don't have anybody else to help me. Folks, that's, that's me. I couldn't get there on my own. When Jesus came and asked me about my salvation, if he came to me and said, said, do you want to be made whole? Do you want this salvation? Do you want this free gift that I'm going to give you? Had I just sat there and said, but I can't do it on my own. I can't get there. I've tried, and people try all the time. I, I've known people that, well, you know, when I get my life cleaned up, when I get this done, or when I do that, then, then maybe I'll think about it. Maybe I'll come to him then. Or I've, I've had people say, well, you know, you just don't know what all I've done. And that's another way of saying, I can't clean up enough. I can't get there. I can't, I can't heal myself. I can't get to the water. And, and that, that's what Jesus said. He said, but you don't have to. You see, I don't have to try. People try for years and years and years and years. They'll try their whole life. You know, people, well, you know, the temptation just so much. I, I, just, can't, I just can't make it. I can't live good. I, I, can't, I, I can't make myself good. Exactly. You can't. That's why Jesus said, but, but take up your bed and go. He reached down and he gave the man a touch and he said, get up, move on. And the man got up. 
He did something that, that for 38 years he probably, he probably gave up all hope. He, he had probably wasn't even close to the water. He'd probably tried for the first five years, six years, whatever. He may have tried when he was a younger man to get to the water. And by this time at 38 years old, he probably, when the water stirred, he probably didn't even hardly turn his head to look. He had done gave up hope. He had done gave up all that he had. He had done gave up the fact that he could get there. But Jesus said, get up. Folks, we've got to quit trying on our own. We've got to quit trying to get there on our own. We've got to, to give up and say, I can only get there through you. It's got to be God. It's got to be Jesus who heals me. It's got to be Him who straightens up my life because I can't get there on my own. And then... It says, and that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn. A multitude being in that place, afterward Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath. And then he disappeared. He, he just completely dropped off. The man did not even know who he was. That's why I said to begin with it, that here in Jerusalem, Jesus was not well known. He, people didn't know who he was. He came in and he healed this man and, and then disappeared and he didn't even know who he was. And, and here... The, the Jews had made all these rules. Now, just like in, in the state of Tennessee, we have laws and then we have rules. There's, a whole, there's more rules than there are laws. You know, the, the Congress or the Senate will pass laws, but then, then, they, then all these committees, they make all these rules. And the, the stack of rules is thicker than the laws that were made. It's crazy. If you ever look at a, a, a rule book, it, it's just crazy how many rules there are. Well, that's kind of the way the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the religious leaders had done. They took the law that God had given and then they wanted to, to pass their own interpretation of it on. You know, they had went so far. God, God said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, the Jew, Jewish leaders, they took that to a further extent. You can't wear false teeth because if you drop them, you, you, you'd have to bend over and pick them up. That'd be work. <laughs> now, I've always heard that. I don't know for sure, but that's, that's one of those stories I've always heard. Uh, you're only allowed to walk so far on the Sabbath. You're only allowed to do this. And they had made all these rules that I have not found anywhere in Scripture where God laid this much of a burden on the people. As a matter of fact, it said that when Jesus was walking through and his disciples picked a head of grain to eat, they tried to chastise a man. And Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So we see that the Jewish leaders had, had imposed their own rules on the Sabbath and it was tradition as so here's the thing when we're dealing with the laws of man now I know that the scripture says that we are to submit to the authority that is over us that's kind of hard to do in this day and age because we are we are under uh, the, the laws that says that we've got to do certain things that goes against our religion we're, we have to, you know, we're not allowed to say certain things if it's going to offend somebody. We're not. Let me tell you something. When God's law, when God's word conflicts with the laws of man, you better obey the laws of God. Man. Here this man, he picked up his bed. Now he knew 
that it was against the law or against the rules for him to pick up his bed. It was against the tradition of the Jewish law to pick up his bed and walk and carry it on the Sabbath. But when you have encountered somebody that has the power to do something that nobody else can do, when you encounter somebody who can, at his word, make you well, who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to this silly tradition? Or are you going to listen to the man that just proved to you that he had the power over the universe? That he had the power over your body? Let me tell you something. When God's law and God's, or Jesus' word conflicts with the rules that the, law, uh, the laws of the land, follow God. Follow what he says, and you can't go wrong. Now, here's the thing. They, they came to him, and they said, Why are you carrying your bed? Well, the man who made me well. Which means he's got more power than you, because I've been laying here for 38 years, and you ain't done nothing for me. You didn't have the power to heal me. So, so this man had the power to heal me, so I'm going to listen to him, and I'm going to do what he says. And then, of course, they said, Well, who is he? I don't know, but he touched me. I don't know who he is yet, but he healed me. There's a lot of people in this world who have had an encounter with Jesus. They don't know a lot about him. And, and here's the thing. To have an encounter with Jesus, you don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to know a lot of scripture. You don't have to know, you don't have to know much of anything at all. All you've got to know is, is that Jesus said, do you want to be better? Do you want, do you want part of me? And if you say yes, that's it. Now, I know that sometimes as, as a Christian, and, and sometimes especially as a new Christian, you come along and you have this encounter with Jesus, and Jesus becomes a part of your life, and he saves you from your sin, and then all of a sudden it feels like you're left all alone. And, and let me tell you something. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, life don't necessarily all of a sudden get easier. And there, there will be times when you feel like you've been abandoned and you feel like you're left all alone. And I'm sure this man who is carrying his bed and the, and the religious leaders have come at him and they're threatening him and they're, 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 they're being mean to him and they're probably threatening to throw him in jail for carrying his, his bed. And he probably felt like this man healed me and left me all alone. Now what am I supposed to do? But guess what? Jesus had his eye on this man. He hadn't left him alone. It says, later, it says that Jesus found him in the temple. Guess what? Jesus didn't have to look for him. He, he didn't really have to look for him. It wasn't like Jesus had lost him and then found him. He knew where he was all along. He just had another encounter with him. And I love this, what he says to this man. I have had this encounter with you. When he healed him, he didn't say anything about his sin. But this time he comes to him and he says, Now, go and have no more sin. That's why I feel like this story has so much to do with our salvation. Jesus, when he encounters you, he expects you to leave him in a better state than he found you. He expects you to leave and live your life for him. That's why you have an encounter with Jesus. That's why Jesus encounters you in life because he wants you to go and be a representative for him. And it says that this man then went and he told the Jews, now I know who did it. Now I know who saved me. Now I know who, who healed me. Now I know, and it was Jesus. There's some commentaries, and, and I've read several, and there's some of them that believe that, that, that they think that this man betrayed Jesus. No, he praised Jesus. He didn't betray him by turning him over to the Jewish leaders. He was, telling, he was bragging on him. And basically he was saying, this man did something for me you couldn't, and there's nothing you can do about it. Folks, that's the attitude that we, when we have had an encounter with Jesus, we need to be praising Him. We need to be telling people, I know who healed me. I know who saved me. And I want to tell you about it. 
They may not want to hear these. The religious leaders of the day didn't want to hear about Jesus. They didn't want to hear. They didn't really want to know who had healed this man. They, were, they would be afraid of whoever it was. But he went and told them anyway. As we go through our life and as we go through, through our Christian life, let me tell you something. We all need healing. We all need that original healing. We all need to make that answer to Jesus and say, only you. I can't do it on my own. I need your healing. This morning, as we uh, close out today, the question is, is, do you need healing? Do you need that healing touch in your soul? Have you been have you been do good as long as I as long as I work toward this then then I will be all right. Have you been that kind of person who has who has failed yourself because you decided to do it on your own? And if that's you, you need healing. You need the kind of healing that only Jesus Christ can give you. So this morning, do you need healing? Because he's asking. He's asking. Second, do you feel alone? Do you feel alone in life? Do you feel like that maybe sometimes that you've, you've been healed, you came and you, and you got saved at some point, but you feel like you've been abandoned and you feel like that maybe God's not right there with you and He's not leading you, He's not directing you, that He has just withdrawn from you. Let me tell you something, He's not withdrawn from you. He has not left you. He is, he is there. He's watching you. But maybe you need to cry back out to Him. Maybe it's you who's not watching Him. Now he, he, see, here's the thing. When this man was healed, he didn't continue to look for Jesus. He just went on his way. Jesus said, take up your bed and go, and he went. Are you looking for Jesus? Did you just go? Did you just... It, but, but if you're feeling abandoned... Let me let you know, He's here. He's near you. He's got His hand on you. He's watching you. Don't feel like, don't feel like that you, don't, you, you can't find Him. Folks, you can't do it on your own. You can't save yourself. You can't get yourself to the water to clean up. Only Jesus can do it. But not only can He's the only one who can get you to salvation, but He's the only one that can keep your life on track. He's the only one that can keep you from feeling abandoned. You can be surrounded by people and feel alone if you're not relying on Jesus Christ. This morning as we stand and we come to this